Hello and welcome to Woo Stream, bringing you anything and everything Willamette. For today's webinar, Professor Warren Binford returns to discuss the current crisis at the U.S. border and its effect on children. Warren Binford is a professor of law and, and the director of the clinical law program at Willamette University College of Law. She is a globally recognized children's rights uh, scholar and advocate, collaborating with numerous domestic and foreign NGOs. Her collaborations have been valuable to issues both national and international. Please be aware that this webinar will be recorded for future viewing. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question tab and we will save time for responses at the end of the presentation. So without further delay, please welcome Professor Warren Binford. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us this evening to learn more about America's border crisis today. Um, the goal of these three presentations is to help people to understand basically how we got to the situation where we appear to be placing children and families on the front lines of a full-blown immigration crisis and to understand how much of this immigration crisis is within our control and how much of it is human made. Um, at the last presentation, we talked about the last 100 years, and that's a lot to squeeze into an, an hour and a half, but we talked about the creation of the Border Patrol, we talked about some of the racist components of Amer America's uh, immigration laws historically, we talked about the growth of the uh, Central American region and Mexico and the way in which we actively solicited labor to come to the United States, we talked about uh, corporate involvement, interference, in uh, the Northern Triangle, which includes Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And we also talked about the U.S. government's um, a very direct overthrow of the Guatemalan government. We focused specifically on Guatemala in the first presentation because so many of the children that I've been interviewing uh, come from Guatemala. It's one of the, the highest sending countries. And today what we're going to do is we're going to pick up where we left off in the last program and start to focus on what has happened over the last few years. As you'll recall from the previous presentation, <clears throat> overall immigration is nowhere near the highest numbers that we've seen historically. If you look back to the, the 1960s, you'll see that the highest numbers of immigration tended to happen in the mid-1980s and also around the, uh, the, the, the trends, the, um, the, the beginning of the 21st century, and that since then, the numbers overall have been relatively low. Despite these relatively low numbers, in 2015, heading into the 2016 election, we had a new presidential candidate, Donald Trump, who, when he announced his presidential run, made another number of comments, both about people from Mexico, as well as about uh, President Obama's uh, DACA program. Basically, what had happened was um, there was a highly dysfunctioning Congress that had not updated the immigration laws, which you learned about during the previous presentation, for decades. And there was a lot of frustration about the fact that we had a significant number of children who had been brought to the United States uh, by their parents, um, and, and these children came here as children and lived their entire lives here and were law-abiding members of the community, were good students, were eligible for college scholarships. In fact, we're going to, to college and everything. And President Obama, in, um, in being frustrated about the lack of Congress's ability to work together across the aisles and come up with comprehensive immigration reform, uh, began to use what are called executive orders in order to explain how executive resources are, are going to be prioritized. So basically what you have is the three branches of government. You have the legislative branch, which is supposed to make the laws, the judicial branch, which is supposed to interpret the laws, and then you have the executive branch, which is supposed to carry out the laws. But what we know is that the executive branch doesn't have all the resources that, is, that are required in order to carry out every single law that's passed by Congress. And so what happens with the executive branch is they decide to prioritize how they're going to use Use those resources. So with President Obama's executive order um, establishing the DACA program, which is Deferred Action on, on, on Childhood Arrivals, he basically said 
We have a number of people who are here in the United States without appropriate documentation. We don't have all the resources that would be necessary to deport every single one of those people. And so what I'm going to do is prioritize people who have broken the law, who are um, you know, affiliated with gangs, people who are um, engaged in destructive activity in our society, and people who came here as children and are living constructive lives and peaceful members of our community and you know doing well in school and everything i'm not going to prioritize their deportation i'm going to give them two years of deferred action it's called where they can have a work permit and complete their college degree or you know work work in a in a job and um and pay taxes into the system and everything and president trump when he announced his candidacy for president said that the number one thing that he was going to do is get rid of DACA and he said a whole bunch of terrible things about Mexico and the types of people that are coming from Mexico. He said they were bringing drugs and crime and that they're rapists and and that ended up setting the tone for a lot of the presidential election. Um, in fact, what ended up happening, everybody knows now that although he lost the popular vote, he in fact did win the electoral college vote and he then um, took office in 2017. And in fact, it wasn't on day one that he terminated DACA, no, but what he did do on one of his first days in office was he passed an executive order um, that was frequently referred to the Muslim ban. Now, I want you to appreciate the irony of this. On the one hand, he's campaigning against the previous presidents, what he says was illegal use of executive orders, and yet, you know, some of the first things that he does is issue executive orders of his own. And although this executive order number 13769 was commonly referred to as the Muslim ban, um, what was important about it to someone like me, a child advocate, is that it suspended all children in a program called the Central American Minors Program, the CAM program. Now, the CAM program was another program that had been set up by President Obama, and this related to that high number of children who were coming to the United States in 2014. Let's just go back to that chart. If you look at 2014, you'll see that although the numbers of people who are coming to the United States were not significant overall, it was less than half a million, that green part of it represented unaccompanied children or family unit members. So parents or other family members who were coming with children, and you see that there was a larger percentage of children and families coming in the overall irregular immigration than what we had seen historically. And in response to that, President Obama created a program called the Central American Minors Program. He recognized that most of these children have family or other relatives living in the United States. As a matter of fact, last year, the percentage of children who were placed with family members or other guardians in the United States was 89%. So almost 90% of these children have adults to live with here. And what President Obama recognized was that the journey from Central America to the United States was very dangerous. And so for children who had parents living in the United States, and at least one of the parents was here legally, he set up the Central American Minors Program, which allowed children to come to the United States after being vetted in their home country in Central America, and they would have to do, they have to undergo a background check, and they'd have to undergo a medical exam, and then there also would have to be a background check done on their parents. And then assuming that everything is clear, they were able to enter the United States via an airplane rather than that overland journey where we talked about last week tends to involve several weeks and has a very high rate of uh, physical assaults, sexual assaults, robberies, kidnappings, trafficking, etc. <coughs> so President Obama had created this CAM program, the Central American Minors Program, in order to deal with the risk to children who were coming to the United States. And in fact, the um, one of the first things that President Trump did was he ended that program. Now, it's interesting because, you know, this, this presentation is called America's Border Crisis Today. 
but what I originally had called it was America's War on Children. And the reason was because so many of these policies targeted children in particular. So in the Muslim ban, what ended up happening is a lawsuit was brought challenging that, uh, that order, that executive order. And in fact, it had to go through several different iterations until finally it was written in such a way that it could uh, withstand judicial scrutiny. Now, you have to keep in mind that the executive branch, although the legislative branch creates the laws, the executive branch is given tremendous latitude in how it prioritizes the implementation of that law, and especially with regard to uh, immigration and, and refugees and asylum seekers. And so this is an area where the judicial branch does tend to be very deferential to the executive branch, including the, the president. So that ban, that executive order in a further iteration ended up being upheld by the Supreme Court and the Trump administration in, in the meanwhile formally terminated the entire Central American Miners Program in uh, August of 2017. What this meant is that children who were already in the United States, almost 1,500 children who were in the United States uh, were barred from renewing their status under the program so that now they were susceptible to uh, being pre pre prioritized in a deportation process. In addition, in addition, 2,714 children who had been conditionally approved to come to the United States to be with their families were barred from entering the United States. And so what that means is that you're creating instability in all of these children's lives. And in fact, for those children who decide to come to the United States anyway, you're forcing them to uh, undertake that uh, overland route. One of the, you know, there's a picture on the right hand side of the slide, and I chose this picture for a reason. Um, if you see the woman who's fourth over from the left, that's Professor Gwen Skinner. And let me talk to you about Professor Skinner for a second. Uh, Professor Skinner joined the Willamette Law Faculty in, in 2008 to begin the International Human Rights Clinic here at Willamette. And, and during that time, she and her students represented numerous refugees. They represented child soldiers. They represented, uh, you know, victims of the Boko Haram who had been, you know, gang raped and you know, held hostage. They represented LGBTQ members of the community from uh, Arab countries and other countries that, that target those populations. And um, as soon as the Muslim ban was announced in early 2017, uh, Professor Skinner immediately went to the Portland airport with other volunteer attorneys and were on the front lines of trying to advocate on behalf of those refugees and make sure that they could be processed um, in accordance with US law. Um, and it was Gwen who actually inspired me to get involved in this work to begin with. And it was in 2017 that I was first invited to go on a Flores visit, which is what got me involved with this entire issue. Now, keep in mind, I'm not an immigration attorney. I am a children's rights attorney. And I was brought into this issue because of the widespread violation of children's rights. But it's that woman right there, Gwen Skinner with the blonde hair, who did that. And in fact, we were sad to have lost her in um, 2017 um, to cancer, um, but all of this work was started by Gwen in, here at Willamette. So also in 2017, there was a memo that was written, and it was believed that this was a memo that was uh, heavily commented on. It was either drafted by Stephen Miller or heavily commented on by Stephen Miller, and Stephen Miller is a policy advisor to um, the President Trump and Stephen Miller is thought to be the architect of a lot of this. And um, this memo wasn't known at the time, but it subsequently had been uncovered. It's now publicly available. And um, Senator Merkley is the one who uncovered this memo. And what you see is that a lot of the policies and the procedures that we witnessed um, in, in the last three years were anticipated through this memo. So it's not that we have a, a, a government that's trying to react to a uh, crisis that is unfolding that they have no control over. No, this is all carefully orchestrated. And these policies and procedures were anticipated in this memo. And the whole purpose of them was to make immigration to the United States so difficult um, that people stopped 
coming entirely, even though they have a right to come here and to claim uh, asylum. Now, what we saw in early 2017 that also wasn't known to most people <coughs> is that the Trump administration was secretly piloting a family separation policy. Now, we all heard of, or I should say you all heard of it in 2018, because that's when it became public. But in fact, I started um, volunteering with some of the attorneys on the front line of this in 2017. And during that process, I started to hear about people on the front lines at the border who started to notice that children were being increasingly separated from their parents, even though the parents had no criminal history, even though there were no signs of abuse. Now, historically, what the US government did is they tried to keep families together, particularly parents and children. They don't always recognize extended family members, such as aunts and grandparents, and uncles and cousins, even when they're adults, um, even though that's part of Latin American culture. But what they did do is try and keep parents and their children together. And the idea here is that if a child is uh, with someone who claims to be their parent, but there's evidence that this person is not their parent, such as a trafficker, then the government would separate the child. If the parent had a felony record that was known <coughs> and was considered to be a risk, then they would separate the child from the parent. Or if the child appeared to be abused or severely neglected and not neglected in the type of way that a child might be neglected going through this really harrowing overland journey for several weeks, but you know, uh, severely neglected in a way that the child's health was at risk, then the, the child might be separated from the parents. But the idea that you would separate children from their parents on a routine basis um, was astounding to many of the people on the front line. So I want you to keep in mind, like we talked about briefly last week, that people are allowed to come to the United States without documentation and present themselves to US government officials for the purpose of seeking asylum. That is lawful. If they come to the United States for other reasons, such as better employment opportunities, such as, you know, being involved with, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, trafficking, then, um, then that is illegal. And that illegality, that crime is a misdemeanor. It is the same level of you or I playing our music too loud and the neighbors calling the police. Now, I want you to imagine living in a society where people could take away your children for committing a misdemeanor, for playing your music too loud. That's not the country that we live in, and it's never been the country that we've lived, lived in until now, regardless of whether somebody was a US citizen or whether they were not a US citizen. So regardless of whether these people were asylum seekers or where, whether they were immigrants, undocumented immigrants who weren't here lawfully, their crime was no worse than that. And yet people on the front line started to see children separated from their parents. So the front line workers, the border patrol, the people who are down in McAllen, Texas started to panic. And they said, we're taking kids away from their parents. Like we don't have a system for this. Normally what happens is when someone arrives in the United States, they get an A number, an alien number, and that alien ID number tracks them as an individual. But historically there have been no family ID numbers and so there is no way to keep kids with parents when I'm trying to put kids and parents back together again and figure out who's in a, fam in a family unit when I'm doing one of these site visits I'm looking at the a numbers where the different individuals are from what their ages are what their names are because remember they have names that are different than ours it's common for women to keep you know their their birth name even after they're married in Latin America and the child can have a name that could be belong to either one of the parents or both of the parents. And so I'm looking for, does this look to be a family unit by grouping together A numbers that are around the same place on the roster? And that's the same thing that the US government does. They have no family ID number. So there were workers in McAllen, Texas that started to create family ID numbers in order to try and keep the children with their parents 
you know, get them back together after their separation. But in fact, the stories that we were told and when we're down in Texas is that when DC found out that the uh, government workers on the front lines down in Texas were creating these family ID numbers, they were told to destroy those records, that they were not to keep track of families, that they were not to assign them family ID numbers, that that's not the way the system worked, and all those records were to be destroyed. And that was happening before you even found out about, you know, about this new practice. So, we have this memo that's come out. We have the termination of the Central American Miners Program. So that leads to more children making the, the journey north overland. And then also in 2017, although it wasn't the first thing that he did, in fact, President Trump made true on his promise to try and terminate the um, Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals Program commonly known as DACA. Now, the people, the ch you know, the children and young people who belong to the DACA program, they are often referred to as dreamers because they want to stay in the United States and they eventually want to become citizens in the United States. However, the, um, the DACA program doesn't give these people a path to citizenship. All it does is give them two years of deferred action that they won't be deported in the next two years as long as they are law-abiding and you know and and productive members of society um so what ended up happening is that after trump president trump announced that he was going to terminate the daca program it was immediately challenged in multiple courts around the country and in fact it was um said that although he could stop taking new applications for daca that people who already had deferred status could continue to renew their deferred action status. And that whole process has wound its way up to the Supreme Court. And, um, and there were oral arguments in that case earlier this year in, in late 2019. And we expect a decision in, in that case uh, later on this spring. And my prediction is, is that the Supreme Court is going to sign side with the Trump presidency and that uh, the recipients of DACA, there are over 800,000 of them, will no longer be able to uh, seek renewed status, renewed deferred status, and that they may start to become, um, you know, de deported, which is really sad because many of these people really were infants, toddlers, school-aged children. Many of them don't speak Spanish. They have lived in America virtually their entire lives. They pay taxes. Some of them have U.S.-born children. Um, and, you know, some of them have um, U.S.-born family members. And so this will break up a lot of families uh, if that decision does come down the way that we expect it to. So also in 2017, the Trump administration took another step that contributed to the creation of this crisis, which is that uh, it started to impose additional processing uh, for families that wanted to take custody of the unaccompanied children who came to the United States. So you'll remember from our last talk that under Flores, Flores is that 1985 class action that established standards for uh, children who come to the United States alone. And what it said is that these children are not supposed to be locked up. They're supposed to be released as expeditiously as possible. Normally, they're not supposed to be in border patrol stations for more than a few hours, no more than 72 hours normally. They're not supposed to be in government custody for more than uh, approximately 20 days. And, um, and they're supposed to be released in order of preference to parents living in the United States, other family members living in the United States, or other adults living in the United States that are authorized by the parents to take custody of the children, not by the government, by the custody of, but by the parents to take care of them. And only if there are no parents, family members, or other adults in the United States who are chosen by the parents to serve as guardians of the children, uh, should the children be kept in government custody. So as I mentioned earlier in this program, that amounts recently to about 89%, 89% uh, of the children who are released from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services are going to one of those first three categories. Well, what happened with the Trump administration is that whenever they released a child to a parent, for example, or another family member, an uncle, an aunt, what they would do is they started to fingerprint not just 
the person, first of all, we didn't used to fingerprint the parents. If you were parents, we did not fingerprint you. <coughs> we would just place your child with you. If you were uh, another family member other than parents, we would fingerprint you, but only you. And we wouldn't look at the rest of the household. We know that a lot of these kids are going to mixed status households, that some of the family members are documented and others are not. This is really typical when you've had as much give and take as America has had over the last century with people from Mexico and Central America. So what ended up happening is not only did they start documenting or fingerprinting the entire household and doing fingerprint, um, doing fingerprints and background checks on them, but they started to share that information with ICE. So you had family members who would come forward to care for unaccompanied children, and rather than have the child sent to them, they'd have ICE show up at their house and start arresting people. And so what ended up happening is not surprisingly, A, it took much longer to process households, and B, you had a lot of people who stopped being willing to come forward because they didn't want to place anyone in their household at risk of deportation. And so this ended up leaving kids stranded in government facilities, even though they had family members who were willing and able to take care of them, but for the ICE raids. So what did this do? Did this decrease immigration to the United States? No, it didn't. And in fact, what we know is that the following year, we had, of course, the giant caravan coming to the United States. And there's some research that shows that if you try and implement a lot of draconian policies around immigration, at least initially, it can, it, it can lead to increased immigration, not decreased immigration. And I wanna just take you back to that first slide again. And in fact, if you look at that, those numbers, you have you know, the high number in 2014 when we had the unaccompanied children coming from Central America because of the rise of gangs and drugs in that area who are fleeing for safety with family members here in the United States. Then we see a drop in 2015, which is when the, you know, Trump, the candidate, makes his announcement that it's all about immigration. And sure enough, he you know, there is an increase in immigration after he starts talking about all the things that he's going to do. And then his first year in office, it actually dies down, you know, the number of kids and adults who are coming to the United States. And then what happens is after he starts to roll out all of these harsh policies, we start to see an increase in immigration in 2018 that then skyrockets in 2019. So clearly these policies aren't working the way they're supposed to be. And if you're focused primarily on you know, the children and family, you'll see in 2019 that the majority of people coming to the United States, they were not single adults, they were children and family members. And so we're ending up having as a result of these policies, exactly the opposite effect of what they were supposed to accomplish. So then let's talk about 2018. <clears throat> so 2018 is famously when the United States public became aware of what the administration was doing to children. That's when we found out that children were being forcibly separated from their parents. And at this point, I have uh, you know, started to volunteer on some of these site visit teams where children are being kept and have started to interview the parents as well. And the stories that I heard were absolutely horrific. They were stories about, for example, um, having CBP officers telling parents that they're going to take their children away to give them showers. And I want you to think about this, showers. This is what the Nazis told parents and when they were you know, taking the children into what were supposed to be the showers and in fact killing them and gassing them. This is a history that's known in the United States widely. It's also a history that's known in Latin America. And so for us to have government officials who are lying to parents and telling them that they're taking their children to give them showers, and then some of those parents have never ever seen their children again, and many of those children are in fact lost in our system, it's truly horrific. When I talk to children about what their experiences were, they talk about being separated forcefully from their parents, 
crying, being separated from other siblings, crying, being kept in another part of the facility. Um, you know, their parents are there, their other siblings are there, but they've separated out family members across the same facility. And then they'd wait until nightfall. And what they would do is after the night came, they would take the children out to vans with blacked out windows. And then they would take those vans to an airport tarmac where there would be buses loaded um, with children and blacked out windows. And then they would put the children on the buses, usually without any parents. There were occasionally the children would sometimes describe um, a young mo mother being there with a young child, but for the most part, there were no or almost no parents on the buses, and the parents that were there, um, you know, were had tender age children, and then they drove these children across state lines hour after hour after hour all night long until they take them to, uh, in, in many cases, I was interviewing children in Texas, these children had been taken to Texas and they were taken to a bus station. And then at that bus station, they were put into more vans and then the vans would drive and drive and drive. And they drop one kid off here and two kids off there and four kids off there until finally um, children were sent to places like this. This is called Casa Padre. <coughs> and Casa Padre is a um, organization, it's a, a shelter that was set up in a former Walmart. When I went to Casa Padre, they had over 1,500 children there. A number of these children had been separated from family members, had been separated from siblings. A number of these children were members of indigenous groups. Um, many of them did not speak Spanish, and some of them had been there for months and months and months, sometimes as much as nine months. These kids were forced to walk around in Casa Padre um, in single file lines past a giant mural of Donald Trump. And under the mural of Donald Trump, it said something to the effect of um, sometimes in order to win the war, we have to lose the battle or something like that. And I'm thinking, what does that even mean? What, what is the message that you're trying to send these kids as you make them march around this, this Walmart in single file lines? The children frequently talked about not having enough to eat. They'd show me how their clothes were falling off them. They talked about hardly ever being able to go outside. They talked about, um, you know, preachers being brought in, um, you know, Southern preachers and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and, it's not, some of the children are used to priests and they, they want a priest there. They want services that are consistent with their religious beliefs that are consistent with their cultural heritage. But instead they're being subjected to all this preaching um, about in a, in a manner, in a culture, in a custom that's not familiar to them. They talk about hardly ever being able to talk to their parents and, um, and, and not being given robust reunification services, not being told how long they're going to be kept there. They're being, they're talking about, you know, being um, forcibly given shots and they don't even know what these shots are for. They don't know, you know, what's happening to them. They don't know where their family is. Um, under the law, under um, Flores, these children are supposed to be allowed to keep in touch with those family members that they were apprehended with. Um, but in talking to the children at Casa Padre and elsewhere, <coughs> there was almost no contact um, you know, with the people that they were separated from. At the same time, I don't have a picture of this, but at the same time that we were interviewing children at Casa Padre, I also went with um, Michael Bohanek from Human Rights Watch out to an adult facility nearby where some of the parents were being kept. And I'll tell you, as heartbreaking as the children's stories were, the parents' stories were even more heartbreaking. The parents could hardly articulate because many of them escaped really horrific conditions under which they were experiencing you know, sexual violence or being forced into gangs or their life was threatened because they had um, witnessed a, a gang killing or something and they were trying to get away with their family. And they brought their families to the United States thinking that they would be able to keep their children safe. But in fact, what happened was that they had lost control of their kids and had not talked to them in, in several months. And they didn't know where the kids were and how they were. They didn't know what adults were taking care of them. And, uh, and it was absolutely devastating for the parents that we interviewed. So at Casa Padre, one of the things that you need to understand about this is that although this is run by a nonprofit called Southwest Key, 
Southwest Key is, is established, is, is recognized as a highly corrupt nonprofit where the president of Southwest Key is engaged in all sorts of uh, self-dealing. And in fact, the rates that they charge to keep the kids here, um, you know, they, the government has not been transparent about what it's paying to lock these kids up. But um, by some of the finances that I've been able to find in media reports and elsewhere, it appears that these kids, depending on the number that are there on any given day, that it's costing the American taxpayers uh, a couple hundred dollars a day to sometimes over $500 a day to keep them in a program like this. And in fact, the president of Southwest Key, um, he, he, is, he refers to himself as Father Juan. There's a, a, there is a mural of him as well. There are actually two murals of him in this facility. One has like the ray of the sun emanating from his head and um, and next to that mural are there were a bunch of dollar bills that were posted on this wall and when I asked a, a Casa Padre employee what are those bills she said oh those are one dollar bills one dollar bills and I said well what are one dollar bills instead of George Washington's face in the oval they have pictures of uh, you know this uh, father Juan and they said that the employees are given those $1 bills as rewards for doing what Father Juan wants them to do. Now, he's not really a father. He is, you know, like as a, a pastor or, a, you know, a, um, a Catholic priest. He actually is an attorney. Um, and, and I would suggest a highly corrupt one at that. Um, so he's basically paying himself over a million dollars a year to lock up what at the time I was there was over 1,500 kids in Casa Padre. Now, I talked to somebody who uh, works there recently, and, and uh, I understand that right now there are only a few dozen children at this site, but uh, they had over 1,500 kids there in the spring of 2018 or summer of 2018 when I was there. Now, in addition to separating kids and placing them in places like Casa Padre, they were also placing them in this location, which was uh, a tent city that was set up in Torneo, Texas. Now, this tent city held thousands of children um, during the time that it was open, and it was run by another nonprofit. Um, some people are very critical of this nonprofit. It's, um, it, it's BCFS, and, um, and basically it, it, it's run it's staffed by many of America's heroes. And when I say America's heroes, I'm talking about uh, law enforcement officers, firefighters, social workers, military, retired military personnel. Some of them are retired and some of them take a leave off their regular jobs in order to work with uh, BCFS. And, um, and it's something like Baptist Children and Family Services is what it stands for. And basically, they have all of these tents in order to respond to emergencies. So when there's a hurricane, these are the people who come and they set up these tents and they give you shelter and they set up a mess tent and they feed you and they set up a medical tent. There are doctors and nurses there and everybody's there to help Americans when we have an emergency. But what happened with in 2018 is that the Trump administration contracted with BCFS to set up, to use its tents, to set up a, an overflow facility for kids arriving from Central America. Now, what the head, the president of BCFS says is that he, he's been inside border patrol facilities. He knows how horrific they are. And so to the extent that we had a real surge and that he was trying to keep kids out of the border patrol facilities, he was happy to bring all of his personnel down to Texas and to set up this temporary facility so that these kids could be in a healthier environment and be outdoors playing soccer. The soccer, they organized a, um, oh gosh, what was it? A, a, a fashion pageant for uh, the girl children who were there and everything. But when he found out 
that in fact this whole thing was orchestrated the crisis was orchestrated that they weren't that the children had relatives here that they weren't placing the children with their relatives that the bottleneck in the system had been created and most importantly that children were being forcefully separated from their parents he said that he didn't want to have any part of it his name's kevin Dinnan, and you can read about him online so what kevin did was he told the trump administration that he was shutting down the 10th city as soon as the um, contract was up and that he was not willing to renew it. And in fact, they offered him more money and he said, you cannot offer me enough money to keep this place open. What you are doing is both wrong and it's stupid and I don't wanna have anything to do with it. And in fact, it was the day after he told the administration that, that um, Donald Trump, President Trump went on television and said that he was going to end the uh, separated child policy. Um, where they were separating children. In the meanwhile, as I was doing some of these visits, one of the things that I saw is that in, for example, the South Texas Family Residential Center, the conditions in which I saw children appeared to be getting noticeably worse. So the children were sicker than we'd seen before. There was widespread illness. The children were dirtier. There were more complaints from parents about a lack of health care being provided to their kids. And in fact, children literally started to die in government custody under these new policies. No child had died in US government uh, immigration custody that we know about since 2010. And in fact, the, um, we know about at least seven children who died between the period of um, spring 2018 and spring 2019. So, um, I, you know, we knew there was something wrong. At the same time, the government said, you know what, we need relief from Flores from the standards because we have too many children and we don't have enough places to house them. And so we want permission from the court, from the Flores court, to allow us to start sending children to unlicensed facilities at military bases. And the court said no. But the Trump administration went ahead and sent these children, um, you know, thousands of children to this uh, abandoned military base in Homestead, Florida, and the facility is called Homestead, that was run by a for-profit corporation. And in fact, this corporation, which is re continues to receive thousands of dollars a day to uh, run this overflow facility, which has only empty beds in it, and we're still paying for it, the taxpayers. Um, if you look at the board of directors and the executives of this corporation, you'll see that there are several people um, from the Trump administration who are on the board and involved in the management of this for-profit corporation where they were locking up children in, in, in 2018 and 2019. So I've mentioned to you that the um, Trump administration sought relief from the Flores standards in 2018. It's interesting because this is where I was when the Trump administration was arguing in court that they did not have enough beds for the children. And this was really important to me because this is really uh, a enlightening moment for me that I saw that what the roster was for the children and the adults at this South Texas residential facility in Dilly, Texas that day. And I knew that they were at about the less than two thirds capacity. I knew they were about 63% capacity. And I had been there about six months before and I knew that they were at a similar capacity then. But the Trump administration literally went into court at the same time I'm sitting in the facility and I've got the list of every kid there. I've got the list of every adult there. I know exactly how many people are there. And in fact, they're telling the court that they don't have enough beds for these family for these families when I know that they have 800 empty beds and I'm looking at them with my own eyes. And so I immediately faxed over a uh, declaration to that effect to the attorneys in Flores and the court did deny the government's motion and said, no, you can't start keeping kids and families in these abandoned unlicensed military bases. Um, you know, but I knew at that point that literally I could not, I could no longer trust the government to tell the truth because I was in a situation where, where they were lying. And unfortunately, it's not, not the last time that it happened. So let's move forward to 2019. So in January 2019, in the midst of all this, the administration announces that they are going to um, start sending families to Mexico. 
while they await their asylum proceedings. Now, I want you to think about this. Some of these families are trying to escape from gangs. And as you know from last time's lecture, these gangs tend to control most of Central America and many parts of Mexico. So if we send them back to Mexico, we are placing them in danger. On top of that, you know, Flores provides that for unaccompanied children and children within families, that there was a court ruling that said the Flores standards apply to all children who arrive in the United States. You're supposed to meet certain standards, but in fact, how is the U.S. government supposed to ensure that those standards are being met if the children are being sent to Mexico and there are no provisions to take care of them? Now, the administration told us that the Mexican government had promised to take care of these children, but in fact, I and some of my other colleagues have gone to Mexico multiple times to interview these children and their families. And this is a picture that I took of, you know, wire fencing around um, a, a shelter where kids are being kept under this corrugated metal roof. And they are just, they are completely unsafe. They are not adequately cared for. And they're being put through this, um, it's, it's absolutely insane. It, it's like something out of Dostoevsky where they're being sent through this processing at three o'clock in the morning where they never really get to see a judge and then they're kept in border patrol facilities for a few days or a week or a week and a half and then dumped in a whole nother part of Mexico and left to travel across Mexico without any shelter, without any uh, transportation, back to a different location on the border where they have to appear for their next court hearing, which also is likely to be this, this same complicated process that has no end to it until finally people start to get worn down. And in fact, what's happening in some cases is that people are actually killed. So I've heard um, a stories, one of my colleagues interviewed two children who were killed before he even, um, before his plane even left Tijuana. I've interviewed multiple families where, and my colleagues, where uh, children have been sexually assaulted, physically assaulted. One little boy had been uh, assaulted three times between October and, and January when, when I interviewed him. He just recently had a hearing and um, the government refused to exempt him from MPP, even though he is developmentally disabled. Uh, he's six years old. He has the functioning of a three-year-old, and he is not able to protect himself from the sexual abuse that he continues to be subject to um, as the U.S. continues to send him back to Mexico. So at the same time that the U.S. is starting to keep more kids out of the United States and keep them down in Mexico, um, they also were basically keeping thousands of children in cages, in locked up cells, in a warehouse, tents in the desert, not just the ones that I showed you, but other tents as well. And I, in fact, walked into a border patrol facility in Clint, Texas last June. And uh, these kids started to come in for interviews with our team and the kids were absolutely filthy. There were no adults taking care of them. They were hardly having any showers. They were not being given adequate food. Some of the children had been there for over three weeks. And keep in mind that children are only supposed to be in border patrol facilities for a few hours. They're supposed to notify the Department of Health and Human Services immediately when a child is taken into border patrol custody and then um, um, the DHHS is supposed to match the child with a placement um, promptly and start reunification uh, efforts to place the child with their family in the United States. And if they have no family in the United States, then to place them in a foster home or other um, placement, which is supposed to be the least restrictive environment possible, but which is in no way this warehouse that you're looking at right here. That's the warehouse in Clint where so many of these kids were being kept. And as you can see, there were virtually no windows. Now, when we walked into Clint um, <clears throat> and the children started to tell us where they were kept, we had a hard time picturing it. And it wasn't until we drove around the facility after that first day and saw the warehouse that we started to realize that the U.S. government may actually be keeping kids in this warehouse. And when we went back the next day, we asked the kids to draw a picture of where they were being kept. And you'll notice that on the right hand side of the screen, it has those nine 
bon banos, um, bathrooms, and then in fact our porta potties that we were able to document outside that we took pictures of, which showed us that the children's descriptions matched exactly what we had seen when we were driving around the facility trying to figure out where all of these kids were being kept. Um, in addition to that, some of the children described being kept in tents um, out behind barbed wire, um, and we later found out that they were in fact being kept in, in, in those tents that you see there, um, and they were also being kept in a loading dock, and they also were being kept in, in prison cells that were supposed to be adults. They were sometimes at three times the capacity of what was allowed. There were 350 children there when we first arrived to Clint, and the facility had originally only been licensed for about 104 adults. And in fact, what we found out is that before we arrived, before they knew that we were coming, they actually had approximately 700 children there at that time. So we have the situation where basically the, um, the administration is creating this bottleneck, leaving kids in, you know, abandoned military bases, border patrol stations, the Tornillo Tent City, um, and, you know, it, it's just an absolute disaster. Um, but then what happens is the U.S. not only enters into um, the deal with Mexico to send these children and their families there under the migrant protection protocols, but they also enter into safe third country agreements with Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Well, what do we know from the last time that we met? We know that these are exactly the countries that they're trying to escape from, and this was one of the the maps that I showed you before, which shows you the drug routes that go right through Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, placing children in harm's way, placing these families in, hard, in, in harm's way. So now if somebody wants to escape from gangs in Honduras, they, they can't just come to the United States. They have to present themselves to the Guatemalan government and say, can you give me asylum here? I'm trying to escape from a gang in Honduras. But remember those countries, how small they are. Remember that the, we were talking about this, they're the size of like Tennessee and Georgia, like, and they're side by side. This is not gonna make safe people who are trying to escape criminal cartels. And so in fact, you know, what we are seeing is that we are keeping children and we are keeping families in places that have high levels of criminal activity, uh, lots of violence, and a high level of poverty. And that's really, <coughs> you know, why I end up calling this a, you know, war on children. Um, and what's surprising is that in this war on children, it's lawyers who are often on the front lines trying to make a difference. So I've talked to you a lot, um, particularly in the last presentation, but a little bit earlier today about the um, about the Flores attorneys, um, but we haven't really talked about Ms. L versus ICE. Ms. L versus ICE is a case that was brought right after the Trump administration announced its family separation policy in spring of 2018. And basically what happened was some attorneys from the ACLU represented one of the mothers who was separated from their children and what she argued and what the ACLU argued on her behalf and the other parents who were in this class um, is that it was a violation of their constitutional right to family integrity to take these children away without due process, without establishing that the children were abused or neglected. And so um, the, uh, the judge in Mazel versus ICE, Dana Sabrow, down in the Southern District of California, this is a US district court, uh, held for the first time that in fact, they did have a right. These families do have a constitutional right to family integrity. Keep in mind that the Constitution doesn't just apply to US citizens, that there are some parts of the Constitution that applies to anyone who is within uh, uh, on US territory. And in fact, um, one of the rights that was recognized as extending to everyone in the country is that the US government ju can't just come along and take away your children because you commit a misdemeanor and, and not return your child to you. And so the court in Ms. L versus ICE ordered that all of the children were to be reunified with their families. Unfortunately, what happened is that, as we talked about earlier tonight, 
the government was not keeping track of these families, that the government had destroyed those family ID numbers that some of the frontline service personnel had tried to create. And so they weren't able to reunify them. And the government tried to take the position that you know this should be the ACLU's responsibility um, because they're the attorneys representing the parents, et cetera, and so on. And Judge Sabro had none of that, but he did put together a team of people who had intelligence because the government proved that it was unable to single-handedly reunite these families and so it brought in several nonprofits that had intelligence about the families and had resources and this has become a multi-team effort to try and patch these families back together unfortunately we now know that there continue to be um, more and more children that we've discovered were separated that were not identified by the government when they were asked to disclose and identify all the children who had been separated in Ms. L versus ICE, that there were additional children, and we fear that we will never know all the children who were forcibly separated from their parents. And we fully anticipate that some of these children will never be reunited because the government did not keep track of either the child or the parent or, or both. You know, they failed to keep track of both family members. In addition to that, the Southern Poverty Law Center has come forward in a couple of different lawsuits. One of them, and remember the Southern Poverty Law Center is, is the one that sued successfully the Ku Klux Klan and bankrupted that organization. That was led by Morris Dees. And the Southern Poverty Law Center um, has brought a lawsuit on behalf of families who were separated, relying on the science which documents that children can experience lifelong trauma or trauma that has lifelong effects as a result of forced separation. In fact, some of the doctors who uh, work with these children and who understand this area of medicine say that what has been done to this, these children constitutes torture, that these children have been tortured for political purposes by the United States government. And in fact, that's partially what is um, suggested in that spring 2017 memo that we opened with. In addition to those two lawsuits being um, litigated, uh, continuing into 2019, the Mizell versus ICE was brought in 2018, the Southern Poverty Law Center was noticed in 20, uh, 18, uh, 2019, excuse me, and is expected to be brought here in 2020. Um, in addition to that, what happened in 2019 is that the Trump administration brought the, um, law brought regulation. So remember the, the Congress makes the law, the legislative branch makes the law through Congress, the judicial branch interprets the laws and the executive branch carries them out. Well, the executive branch gets to promulgate regulations, which are like the details of the laws. They have the authority to do that. And in this case, the government was supposed to promulgate regulations about how it would process children quickly consistent with the Flores lawsuit that was brought in 1985 that was settled in you know 1997. But what happened was no previous administration had ever promulgated these regulations and by the time the Trump administration promulgated the regulations, the regulations bear no resemblance to the Flores standards whatsoever. Instead what they say is that the government can basically lock families up indefinitely in facilities that are not licensed and that there would be no external oversight. So like somebody like me wouldn't be able to come in and say, hey, you're not feeding these kids enough. You're not giving these children showers. That it doesn't appear that you are reunifying these children or placing their these children with their families quickly enough and then you know report that back to the, the children's attorneys so that it can be presented to court. So what happened was the government asked that the uh, court terminate Flores and so that the regulations could take effect, but the court held that these regulations ran counter to Flores, to the Flores standards, and so the regulations have not been implemented and Flores has not been terminated. The Trump administration was very unhappy with that ruling and so they appealed it to the Ninth Circuit and it's currently before the Ninth Circuit, and it's expected that it will go all the way to the Supreme Court. And then the last case that I wanted to mention, it doesn't really focus on children, but it's a very important case because it's, it's called Lost Americas versus Trump. And basically what it says is that the entire immigration system is being dismantled in a way that it is becoming 
weaponized against these children and their families and other asylum seekers. And rather than allowing people to lawfully pursue appropriate immigration statuses, and uh, it is being used against them in a way that is hurting children and hurting families and hurting individuals. And with that, I just want to share with you this picture of that a little boy drew from for me of his house back in um, Latin America. And this is his family and this is the home that he left behind. I think it's really, really important for us to recognize that many of these children arrive to us with a great deal of love and joy in their hearts. And in fact, if you look at their levels of resilience, there's research that suggests that when children immigrate to the United States and they arrive to the US border, they have higher levels of resilience than native born children. Um, but but that within two years of being in the custody of the US government and experiencing the racism that we subject them to, that they end up experiencing um, you know, significant levels of psychological trauma, which affects their resilience. And we also know that um, children who immigrate to the United States have higher levels of educational attainment overall than children who don't. And so it's really important that we recognize that as, you know, as much as we love our own children and need to nurture them and take care of them, that we also are being a gift, being given a gift with many of the children who arrive at the US border. And for those who are processed lawfully and, and have legal grounds to stay, we may, need to make sure that that processing is humane and that it respects these children's rights so that those who do remain to us um, are not damaged by their experiences going through the immigration system. And now I'd like to open it up for questions. Okay, so our first question is, what can I do to become more involved in addressing this crisis? Well, it depends on who you are. So if you are an attorney, you could give up your job at a law firm or the government or wherever it is that you work and move down to the border and you can spend all day, every day, helping these children and families who are trying to navigate this incredibly challenging system that they've caught themselves in. If you are a healthcare worker, you could volunteer to go down and do, you could go down, you could move down to the border and provide medical care to these kids who are stuck in Mexico with their families. Um, you could provide them with you know, voluntary health care, or you could, if you don't want to give up your job either as an attorney or, or a health care worker, you could go down for a working vacation. We're trying to schedule a border service trip right now here at Willamette, and that's scheduled for the, this summer. It's going to be the last week of June, and we're planning to go down to El Paso, Texas, and, um, and do some service work down there and also learn more about this crisis. Um, in addition to those opportunities, if you are a teacher, um, you could go down and volunteer in some of the preschools and some of the um, elementary schools that have been set up in some of these shelters along the border in order to provide children with educational opportunities. If you can't do any of those things, you can support organizations that are, are doing this work. Um, you know, Willamette's clinical law program is, is providing representation um, and work we're trying to do a lot of work. We're, we're going down there with our students and trying to work with this population. You can support our program. You can support other nonprofits doing important work on the border. Um, also, most importantly, it is critical. I don't care whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or Green Party or an Independent. I've been all of them. You need to vote for public officials who will stop violating people's legal rights. We really need to elect people who will respect the rule of law. I am not an open borders advocate. I'm not saying that we need to let every person who wants to come to the US to the US, but what I am saying is, is that we have to process them in accordance with the law. And there are laws about how children are to be treated and how they are to be uh, processed. And right now we're not following those processes and we're violating those standards. So make sure that you get out there and vote for people who respect the rule of law and will uphold them, especially with regard to kids. Since you, message, since you message, mentioned the uh, service trip, are you planning to participate on the June service trip? 
Yeah, absolutely. I will be there. I'll be there all week. And I went down and um, picked out this location for our alumni in January. And so I'm familiar with the organization that we're working with to organize this trip. I'm familiar with El Paso. I've made multiple trips there. I'm familiar, uh, you know, with Juarez and, you know, have interviewed children and families there. And so in working with the Willamette leadership, we thought that this was the best opportunity for our alumni to go there and have a balanced experience of both an educational experience as well as an opportunity to have um, to provide meaningful service to children and families in need. So I'll be there. Okay. How can we alert more Americans to the reality that this crisis amounts to the erosion of our rights as citizens regarding the bottleneck created by the new in, uh, internal processing practices? What? Uh, what are the best ways to alleviate the problem? Okay, so I don't know that I understand the question because I think that we accidentally combined two questions. Oh. So what is the first question? Oh, let me, oh, I'm sorry, I did combine two. Uh, how can we alert more Americans to the reality that this crisis amounts to the erosion of our rights as citizens? Right, so I think one thing is that it's critical that we not get stuck in our silos. It is so, so hard right now to talk across the aisle um, that we, I mean, we've, we've now been receiving years of evidence that we're being manipulated by foreign powers and being encouraged to turn against each other, to stop listening to each other. And, you know, we know that we are potentially pawns in a foreign powers game to try and weaken our country. And so I think it's really, really important that we engage across blue, red, green, that we listen to others, we try and understand where they're coming from, that we compile um, reliable sources, that we're thoughtful about the sources that we identify and that we feed our minds with and that we encourage other people to do the same. I think it's really important that, you know, when we're having Thanksgiving dinner, that we don't just invite the people that we agree with, but we invite the people that we disagree with as well, and that we not be afraid to um, engage with one another. I think that you use social media. I think you use, you know, friendships. I think that y you try and support um, candidates and public leaders who are advancing messaging around this issue. I know that Senator Merkley is, has been, you know, probably the most prominent Senate leader and the most effective Senate leader in trying to consistently bring public awareness to this issue. He's the one who uncovered the, um, the spring 2017 memo. Um, but I think it, a lot of it is the importance of getting outside of our silos and engaging with one another and providing sources that are reliable that will educate other people about what's experiencing. But I, I share your panic. I mean, we really are seeing an erosion of the rule of law. And for a lawyer, that's especially frightening because without the rule of law, we actually lose civilization. Regarding the bottleneck created by the new inter internal processing practices, what is the best way to alleviate that problem? Well, one is, is that it used to be that there was an agreement that DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, would not share background data with ICE. And I think we need to go back to that agreement that we need to separate enforcement from child welfare. And really putting these children with their families as quickly as possible is all about child welfare. And we just need to say, we're going to get these kids to where they need to be safely and we'll let ICE do their work on their own. They can do their investigations, they can identify who they want to, but we shouldn't be exploiting the, you know, the children's you know, welfare for the purpose of then going and arresting their, you know, their aunt or their grandma or whoever it is that we need to put these kids first. Um, as I mentioned early in this program, the federal government does not have the money or the resources to deport everybody in this country who is subject to deportation. So prioritizing 
a little seven-year-old grandma is not that, you know, that just shows that there's something else going on here. I think that the approach needs to be, let's focus on the people who are involved in criminal activities. Let's focus on the people who are involved in gangs. And, you know, and, and that I'm sure will, will keep us busy enough that we don't have to worry about grandmas and aunties and people like that. While you were speaking this evening, a question in tonight's Democratic debate was, should we close our borders to protect us from the threat of coronavirus? That seems to illustrate how easy it is to use situations like a virus to justify an anti-immigration agenda. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I think I shared earlier that I'm not an open borders advocate, that I think that it is our country's job to our government's job to keep us safe. And one of the ways in which you define a country is in accordance with its borders. But I absolutely think that we need to respect the fact that our laws, our nation's laws, the treaties that we've signed, give people the right to come to the United States for the purpose of claiming asylum. And that we can't abuse and neglect children or subject them to the torture of being separated from their parents when they come here for those lawful reasons. For people who come to the United States not for the purpose of seeking asylum, they should be deported, but they should be deported humanely and they should be provided with services throughout that process. And they should be kept together as a family throughout that process. And there you know, should be some follow up with their home government so that whatever is driving them to leave their country, such as economic challenges need to be addressed. And this, this ties into our third lecture, which will, will probably be in, in April, I believe. March. Okay, so um, it'll be in March. And what we're going to talk about is going forward. And this really talks, it'll tie more into climate change and the fact that climate change is driving more and more migration. It'll also talk about economic inequality around the globe and how that's driving a lot of human migration. And, and you know, and the thing is, is that we need to be focusing on in the United States on empowering other countries to have vibrant economies, to have secure communities so that they don't have to make this horrendous community, take children you know, from the only village that they've ever known, the only town they've ever known, take them away from extended families, community members, churches, et cetera, and bring them to another country. We need to strengthen those communities and strengthen those countries so that way you know, they can have sustainable lives there. So I do agree with you, though, that there is this fear that is being stoked by anti-immigration um, advocates who say, oh, you know, they're going to bring disease or they're going to bring poverty or they're going to bring gangs or they're going to be rapists, you know, and I think that we can't live in a state of fear that we need to be proactive as a nation. We need to be saying, OK, and, you know, how do we get the best of the best? If we know that the kids who come here are going to have higher educational attainment than our own kids, God bless my daughters, like, I want those kids here and I want to find legal pathways to bring them here. And for like DACA kids who are going to college and doing well and pursuing their PhDs and becoming doctors, and becoming lawyers and everything, I want to find ways to keep them here. And if we are constantly in a state of fear and we say, oh no, oh no, there's a new disease out there or there's a new gang or there's, you know, this a new drug that's finding its way up from Latin America and we allow that to drive our immigration policies, that fear then I feel like we're not going to be a proactive society, which is creating this nation that will carry us into the 21st century with strength and humanity and love in a way that will nurture these children and families so that they then become the building blocks of the next generation of, of Americans. Okay. Um, last question is, what are some other news shows podcasts that you've appeared or been featured on? Oh my gosh. So here, this is funny. So, um, and so when I went public and in cleanse, I ended up going through this unbelievable media frenzy, unlike anything I could ever imagine. I literally was giving interviews all over the world, 24 hours a day. And, um, and I actually 
did the Clint visit 10 days before I was doing Willamette's uh, faculty exchange program with uh, Tokyo International University, which you all know because you're alumni. And, um, and what ended up happening is I, I did like 10 days of nonstop interviews and then I land in Tokyo and I'm still getting these telephone calls. I mean, it's like everybody, it's the New York Times and the NPR, it's NPR and it is, uh, you know, the Guardian and the BBC and y you name it, I've been on it, um, including, you know, the only one that wasn't interested in interviewing me was Fox, but in any event, no surprise there. But, um, you know, although they did do a segment um, that included um, some reporting about me, but they didn't interview me personally. But in any event, so I get to Tokyo and I have this really weird broadcast. I have this banjo uh, podcast that's asking to interview me. And then there's this other show called Pod Save America or something like that. And I'm like, Pod Save America, what kind of a podcast is that? So they said, you know, will you, will you give us an interview? And, and, and I said, yes, because it was everything to me to try and speak to every person I could to get these children's stories out there because President Trump had gone on national television and basically called me a liar. And that was the second time that I, I realized that the um, I, I could no longer trust the government to tell the truth because I had had these two experiences on the front lines. So I said yes to this crazy Pod Save America group. Um, and they said, you know, can can you speak at this time? And I said, well, that's I'm in Tokyo. That's two o'clock in the morning, my time. Can we schedule it for another time? And they said, oh, we didn't realize you know, that it was 2 a.m. We'll call you back. We'll get back to you. They get back to me. And they said, no, we can't schedule it for another time. So I wake up at 1.45 a.m. in Tokyo. I then have this interview with this person that I have no idea who he is. I answer his questions and everything. And then I immediately go back upstairs and I go back to sleep and I wake up the next day and my phone has completely blown up because apparently Pod Save America is like the best podcast ever. And I had no idea. And so I all of a sudden was like getting all of these, you know, love texts from all my students and all of my friends, kids and everybody who's young and hip in my life heard me on Pod Save America, and I had no idea who I was even talking to, and I just gave them this interview in the middle of the night. But it's interesting because I've, say, I've stayed in touch with the hosts of Pod Save America, and, um, and they came to Portland recently, and they invited me and um, my kids and some kids of other adult kids and, and, you know, and teenagers of other people here at Willamette to come and meet with them backstage. And they were just so gracious and so down to earth and so wonderful. And I think it's hilarious that I had absolutely no idea that they were a celebrity podcast and that I totally did in my sleep. So you should catch that Pod Save America podcast. And there are a few others out there. But that's my my favorite podcast, just because I had no idea what I was doing or who they were. All right. So uh, finally, do you have any thoughts to leave the audience with? Come back next month. We're going to talk more. We'll talk about you know the climate change, and we'll talk about the you know the uh, in, inequalities around the world, and we'll talk about solutions. This is where I'm going to give you some ideas about things that you can do, both big picture and and in more concrete ways. And then I encourage you to to keep an eye out for the service trip sign up in June. That's going to be a limited number of spots, and I want to make sure that we have a group that's really dedicated and, and you know enthusiastic about going down and trying to help these children and their families because it's so important to me and I'm so grateful to have all of you here as well. Okay. We would like to thank Professor Binford for her engaging and informative presentation and giving her time to help spread awareness of the reality at the border. We'd also like to thank the crew for bringing Wu Stream to life. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, be sure to tune in again next month for part three, right here from Wu Stream. And finally, thank you, uh, thank you. Woo stream would not be possible without viewers like you.